This is a new voice for a new Scotland. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Two Old Heads, as usual, with myself and Mike Fenwick. And tonight we're joined by Ali Graham from uh, Butterflies Rising. And uh, we're going to be joined by Elsa Connell from Navy Not Nuclear shortly. Tonight's programme is, is it's going to be based on on the the input that women have uh, in in the independence movement. Given the fact that the it's usually male voices that you hear, uh, and the women so they tend to get on quietly in the background uh, and we want to find out exactly what's happening because there's more of them than there is us. Listen, I try and do some homework when we've got a guest on, and just try and research not who they are, but who they represent, what they're doing. I'm not on Twitter, so I relied on Butterflies Rising Facebook page to try and get an idea of what you were doing. And what I found was an immense amount of pictorial content, which was all, in my opinion, positively designed to be life-affirming. Could you explain to me why that is maybe how you've chosen to use your Facebook page? Absolutely. I mean, the whole ethos of our group, Butterflies Rising, is that we wanted to create something that was for everybody that didn't have any kind of barriers to entry of people who were not quite there yet with the whole national debate on you know Scotland's future. They had questions and they wanted a kind of safe place and we, this is people we've met through canvassing and through campaigning and through you know being on marches and at rallies and people coming up and chatting to you and you know conversations we've had when we've been out with as a group you know pre-COVID um, in the like cafes and what have you. So yep. the idea is to, to have a wider door and a longer table for a conversation. You know, the only rules are the conversation has to be respectful. And I think if you set that standard out, it encourages people to feel that they're safe to view their opinion without being shouted down. And I think, you know, women who want to come to, I cannot, I can use loosely all women group because we Butterfly Rising's Facebook page, the closed page, is a women's page because we were asked for that. There's, you know, people felt maybe that in branch meetings of their member political party, although it is a apolitical group, there's people of all parties and none. But you know, they wanted, they maybe felt that the you kind of alluded to earlier on about kind of men's voices that they maybe didn't feel comfortable or not yet confident enough to kind of speak up. And it was that idea of giving them that level of confidence by having a kind of safe space to, you know, to practice, a kind of safe environment kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but we have also got a Pals of Butterfly Rising group because we really want to try and make the conversation as inclusive as possible. So we've got a Pals of, which, you know, you know is open to everybody and, you know, a lot of the content is, is replaced across both. But people know that if they want to, um, on, the, on the Butterflies only page and the closed page, that they feel that that's kind of their page and it's their space and they're quite comfortable to, to you know, air opinions and there's some robust debates, but always respectfully done. Um, we've had, you know, a number of meetings. Now, we only started the group in October, actually, for the Independence March in Edinburgh. That okay. was, um, you know, our kind of first kind of launch. And it's already, like, proved very popular. I mean, our Twitter page has, has got quite a lot of followers and stuff now, and that seems to be growing daily. Um, and I think the more you interact with people, the more you realise there's a big appetite for a kind of grown-up conversation, but also that there's no... I mean, we talked, to, I know, briefly before we kind of came on here, but the kind of Twitter and its reputation or Facebook and its reputation, they're only tools. It's just what people do with them. And I think yeah. if you set out really clearly what the kind of rules of the engagement are, most people will follow it and if they know that you know if you don't you're out you know that that's the kind of rules of our facebook page we've got r rules of engagement to to be a part of that and uh, if you don't follow it you know we, we respectfully ask you that this is maybe not the place for you because you know we've got a kind of protection that if members so here. what you what you've got is a, a place of comfort if you like where people can come in and start engaging yeah but i mean comfort you know we're not we're not beyond, you know, very robust debate. I mean, there's a lot okay. of very intelligent women are, are in the group who want to, you know, have that place to, to know they can finish a sentence 
with everything closed down. And I think that's maybe what I was going to try and raise today. I've been reading um, this book, Three Women, which is fantastic. And I went to a 5.15 talk with the author, which means you look to interviewing people, you know, she, what she's discovered is there's a very different style for women that, that, that couldn't probably have been done by a man. And this is obviously stereotyping a bit, but women tend to listen more and talk less over people that you know the men will ask a question back yeah, so yeah. i think maybe there's something in that and there's something that leslie reddick said at a meeting a, a long time ago i was saying we've got two ears and one mouth we should use them in that ratio and i think that's really important across the board that but we can all be passionate about stuff which is which is great but if we don't listen we'll lose a good bit of the debate because consensus is really important and, you know, if you get behind something as a consensus, it might not be the thing that was your preferred option. But as long as people feel that there's been a, a kind of democratic process, most people can get behind that. And I think this is something that there needs to be a lot of learning on quite quickly if we want to build a better nation for Scotland, that we really need to listen to all voices. And people, you know, it's very easy to go at the kind of sharks and the jets, like, you know, A against B, whatever. But um, it's not really helpful because we all live here and we really all have to learn to to listen and disagree in a more respectful way so that we can try and at least find that common ground, you know, the, the, the centre of the Venn diagram that we agree on. Yeah. And, and once we've got that and, you know, we've built a relationship there, we can work outwards. And, you know, the other thing um, on that was, and I think, again, this quote and Leslie um, is... You know, we were in a UK context, you're saying the UK UK make deals where the rest of the world do relationships. And I do think, in my experience, women do relationships pretty well. You know, that they'll try and build that kind of connection and that kind of safe ground before they start getting into something that's maybe potentially more contentious. So that once you get to the contentious subject, you've already set the ground rules of the, the rules of the debate. I was doing a, a post on... Uh, it's a small Facebook page I run and someone asked me a question which I tried to respond to it's about the covenant and what happens thereafter and the, 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 the bit I want to draw out and it fits in with what you're saying is that at the moment what we're watching and I think quite historically is the last days of another empire which is the UK they haven't come to grips with that yet but I think that's part of what Scotland is recognising. Sorry, things have moved on. What I was making was that the UK have everything to lose at the moment, even how they imagine themselves as being, whereas Scotland has got everything to gain. But we've got to be, to try and follow on your point, we've got to be very careful how we reach a consensus on what it is we're trying to do. Earlier on, before we started recording, you and I agreed in something is that it can't just be changing a nameplate on something. It's got to be a radical transformation of what we want Scotland to be. Exactly. And, you know, uh, we shouldn't be limited in our ambition by what we see in the UK structures. You know, there's, there's lots of conversations going on just now. And it's really quite you know, energising when you speak to other people that have got very similar ideas of, but why do we do that? And it's a bit like the child's question. We used to call it the power of the idiot question in meetings. But it's about, but why? Because most people in the room go, oh, I don't know, because we've always done it like that. And it's like, you know, I'm very much involved with community politics or community engagement and stuff. And, uh, you know, that has come to the absolute fore during COVID across the country. Yeah. And if we don't grab that with both hands and understand not just what people have done, but why people have done it, we've really missed a trick. Because that is real democratic empowerment of people to say, actually, there's a problem. How do we solve this? One of the things we know at the moment, we have a set of ladies who have been told by the court that they're anonymous. How does that come over when you're looking at it from a female position? Is How important is it that women are protected when they're dealing with something like that, as opposed to the fact that it would appear, perhaps, that lies were told? Should protection still be afforded to someone in that situation? I'm not really going to respond to that from a woman's point of view, but more from a legal point of view. 
that I don't understand why there, there should be consistency. I think most people respond to consistency of how people are dealt with. And if somebody who's accused of a crime, which is a really serious crime, is not anonymous in some cases, and yet is anonymous in a case that's going on at the moment in Westminster, you know, I believe investigation, somebody who's not even suspended, putting a hat back on as a woman, would I be comfortable walking the corridors of Westminster knowing somebody that, you know, I don't know who they are, my, me and, you know, whatever colleagues, w would you feel safe in that sense? No, but it, there just doesn't seem to be any consistency. Now, once allegations have gone through the court procedure and have been, you know, the, the, the accused has been found not guilty, that we then don't know who these people are, which I couldn't get my head around. I've never seen that happening before because I have seen people have been taken to court before for false accusations, you know, that which it's really difficult because the big picture is, does this put people off? I mean, it's a very serious allegations and I guess it can happen to anybody and how would you feel if you were <laughs> So I can I pull it back to it's the, it's the consistency that really worries me and from what I'm now hearing, there's something on this evening. Be anonymous, why would you do that? I don't get that. Yeah, if you want to be anonymous, what's your reasons for wanting to be anonymous? If that's encouraged people to come forward, the conclusion I came to is that the judge should be in charge of what takes place in a court. So she has the right to decide whether something should be or someone should be made anonymous. But she should take an opinion from the jury because the jury are the peers of the people who have decided that someone is guilty, not guilty, not proven. And they've done that on the basis of listening to everything. So. I would have thought that the judge should perhaps ask the jury for an opinion on whether anonymity should be granted. Now, ignoring the current case completely when I say this, mm -hmm. if someone challenges someone in court and it turns out that everything, absolutely everything they have said is a complete lie, a complete fabrication, there's not a shred of truth in anything, yet they've run the risk of sending someone to prison I don't think for a second that person should be granted anonymity. I think we should know exactly what is going on. And I'm avoiding the current case completely when I say that. I mean, anonymity in perpetuity seems very unusual to say that even after you've come through the, pro the legal process and come out the other side of it and the conviction wasn't made. I, I, I don't know the details. I can't see the rationale for that. There must be. And because the rationale is not transparent, how do you know whether that applies to other cases? Because this really affects how people go on beyond here for cases like this. Does this mean that you have, you know, anonymity? If you, you can say, accuse anybody of anything and you can be anonymous? Like, That's why I asked the question in, in that think, way. Yeah, this is where I think it's... There is no law that actually protects, so that gives a, 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 an alleged victim uh, anonymity. It's a custom. It's not a law. There is no such law that gives them anonymity. But the courts all follow it as though it was. Does that not create a precedent, So, If this has been done in this case, could other people not? It's done in every case that is, that is sex-based. And the reason is that they do it is because they say that if they don't, people that have really been attacked or been assaulted will be afraid to come forward and guilty people will get off. And I can understand that. But the, the, the person who is charged should not be identified until after uh, until after he's been found guilty. And after he's been found innocent, there is no way that broadcast state broadcasting companies should be able to do hatchet jobs. And believe me, that's what's going to happen at nine o'clock tonight. Three of the women that, that, that were at that case that, that, that are still demanding their anonymity are coming on again to attack an innocent man afterwards, and that should not be allowed. That is absolutely disgusting. I'm not being contemptuous to the court, but the law is an ass. And then we've been joined by Elsa Connell from the Navy Not Nuclear. Uh, welcome to two old heads uh, uh, on this side of the camera instead of watching on your large screen TV. Yes, I know it was very interesting watching it on the large screen TV. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to raise, and before you joined us, Ailes, I'd given Ali a warning of it. I can't solve the problem of WASPy, 
but there's an awful lot of discussion about pensions and I wanted just to deal with that very quickly. Not One of the things you'll see frequently mentioned is I've been paying in for so many years into national insurance. I've made all the contributions I could make. Why am I being deprived of my pension until a later age? One of the things, there was a court case that was done by, I think, Mrs. Carson. I could get the name wrong. She was Australian. And she decided to say, I'm in Australia. The deal we've got with the UK is that my pension doesn't get index linked. There's no triple guarantee built into it. I think that's wrong because I've paid in the same as my sister, who's still back in the UK, and she's getting the, the benefit. She took it to all the courts in London, up and up and up and up. And eventually it ended up in a court in Strasbourg. This is about 10 years ago. It went to the highest level. And eventually a decision was taken saying, no, look, you've misunderstood what national insurance is all about. But this was how it was done. So I'm going to ask you all to imagine you're driving a car at the moment and you've got all this year's national insurance contributions in front of you. You're going to come to a roundabout where there are all sorts of exits off that roundabout. And at the first exit, someone's going to say to you, this is the queue for people who have disabilities that the National Insurance Fund pays for. At the next exit, there's another queue. And this is the queue for people who were made unemployed and need universal credit or whatever else. You keep going and there's another exit and there's another queue. Maybe it's for widow's bereavement benefit. Maybe the next one is for maternity benefit. All of this is paid for out of the National Insurance Fund, as is the biggest exit you can find, which is the NHS. So when people think I've paid all my national insurance, yes, you have. You may not have, you may not be a widow. You may not have ever been unemployed. You may not ever have used the NHS, but someone has, and that's what your contributions are also paying for. There comes a point that those in charge of the national insurance system that's meant to be paying for this have to realize certain things. One, 1950s, I would have died just after I was 60. The two good ladies in front of me would have died a couple of years after me. So when someone was planning how much money they needed for all the things I've just mentioned, they didn't have a long time to think about. But they should have noticed that people were beginning to live longer. And this is where you get into politics. Now shut up and after I've said this. Politicians exist to get votes. To get votes, they like telling stories to people that doesn't upset them. It isn't the truth. That's why we ended up with WASPI. Because the politicians for the last maybe 20, 30 years haven't told people the painful truth. And there was a report done today by an insurance company. It only came out today. I still follow these things, although I'm not involved any longer. And what it said was that the COVID outbreak is going to very badly affect pensions and a gender balance between men and women. And the reason for that is that women will decide at the moment, hang on a minute, I don't know whether through this auto enrollment thing I can put in as much money as I've been doing in the past. They'll want to budget for other things because they've only got so much money available. Two, they maybe don't like the idea of putting the money into the stock market. They're maybe looking for somewhere safer to put it. It might be a credit union, it might be a building society. But the net effect of that is there will be less pension available. That is also true now for a lot of people who are going to lose their jobs. And again, people are not living up to that because they're not being told the truth. When we think now maybe the pension age is going to go to 68, it could be a lot longer than that. If we all keep living longer and we haven't put in enough money and the government has squelched it off on something else, bring it, I could bring in Trident at this point, I won't, mm. but that, Scotland, when it becomes independent, has got to sit back, take an absolute deep breath and start rethinking all the things that we've grown used to. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're right in what you're saying, Mike. I mean, when we get independence, it's just about pressing a big reset button. Everything that's gone before, we, we choose where we want to go and what we're going to spend our money on. 
I think that's the key thing, Ailsa, it's about choice. And self-determination doesn't end at independence. Self-determination, independence is the key to self-determination for everything that comes after. You know, we need to democratically empower people to make decisions. You know, there's a lot of talks now about, you know, in a lot of pages about EFTA and EU and all the different things, whatever. That's a decision for the people of Scotland. You know, that is a decision for people post-independence. We can we can absolutely set out the art of the possible. And I think this is where we didn't do that in 2014 of, you know, have that, you know, what, what are our options? What's our menu choices? And I think, you know, every, every step in the ro roadmap to independence and beyond is a series of choices. And I think for me, participatory democracy, the way things are being done in small, you know, independent countries all the time, like in Ireland and in, you know, Iceland, you know, crowdfunding constitutions and stuff, or crowdfunding constitutions, um, that, that is actually a more rational approach. And we will look back in 20 years time and think, what are we thinking about giving people all the power for five years? You know, people talk about, well, that was in the manifesto, but, you know, when you've got a limited set of choices, you'll go for certain things that call out in the manifesto that you are passionate about, that your common purpose or whatever. That doesn't mean to say you agree with everything in it, but the party that gets into power takes your rubber stamp as a rubber stamp on everything. And that to me is really quite dangerous because things can be very varied and we do not want to disengage the population. We want to engage our population in politics. And that's why, you know, again, my compassion community politics is that the closer you bring democracy to the people, the more engaged they are with it. If you've got more power at a local level, more people will be involved because they can actually see it, touch it, feel it. You know, they can really be involved in things that matter to them and they see the results of. For a lot of people, a national debate is just too far away. They feel disempowered. They've not got their voices meaningless in it and the more we engage people at a, a, a local level the more likely they are to build confidence to raise their heads uh, you know a regional a national it's a very very good indicator of that and i think there's a lot of people in scotland are beginning to understand is the martin keating's section 30 court order that that should have been the scottish government that were going to court it wasn't that was martin, god bless him took it took it on board risked everything mm -hmm and had faith in the Scottish people and said, look, this is what it's going to cost. That is the truth of something that I always look for. Someone actually just said, look, this is going to cost £40,000. Now we need another £150,000. I'll take the risk, but would you please back me? And you then get Pete Wishart saying, I don't know whether this is a good idea. That is a perfect example of what you're talking about, Ali, where the people have got engaged. In, in a way, I'm not disagreeing about, you know, that the Scottish government could maybe have gone down this road for whatever reason they didn't. But the fact Martin did it, like an, a normal citizen, is actually quite empowering to other people to go, wow, you did that. Oh, wow. Look, people got behind you. It must be amazingly, you know, empowering for, for Martin to think people who don't know him are actually putting money into his uh, crowdfunder. So I think things like this, when you see small... Uh, villages like the ones buying the the land off the book of clue and you know eggs community council whatever that really gives people a lift and it also gives people a uh, understanding that well if they can do it why can't we you know we've got very big kind of ambitions in our community council and um, because we think well if we don't do it who else is going to do it nobody's going to do it for us you know ask for forgiveness not permission kind of thing mm -hmm. but i think interestingly i think pete's um contribution has uh, actually <laughs> enhanced the crowdfunder quite a lot over the weekend. So, you know, no such thing as bad publicity and all that. So I think it's actually given a boost. But I think the serious point is that, you know, the, the people empowerment thing is almost the bigger message in that, that why can't we do this? You know, you're, you're seeing it to be it. You know what I mean? You're saying, well, we can do this for ourselves. We have to act self-determined. If we want to be self-determined. I don't know if you noticed that uh, this week they've, re they've reconvened the Citizens' Assembly. Oh no, I didn't. But I'm interested in that. Two days ago. Uh, basically they were closed down for Covid mm -hmm. and uh, they are now going back and they've put a load of stuff on their website so that people can sort of go over what they've discussed already and where they're at on it. 
and I'm amazed at my stuff good. Then they've only got about two months to go before it's finished, yeah. The participated democracy is something that I'm like really interested in. And I went to the sessions that Oliver Escobar did at Edinburgh University and the, the most fascinating part was Louise, who's on the Irish Citizen Assembly, who was there. And you know, there was a panel of experts, I mean, but Louise was actually sold the show because she was there and she could answer every question. Some people tried to kind of derail it a bit, and but she, in a really good way, and I thought that's just so butterfly rise, and that's our whole kind of concept of, she totally closed the person down in a really good way. I think the person said, how would this work in Scotland with an average age of, of nine? And instead of saying, arguing against that, you know, reacting, she said, everybody's entitled to their view. We had people there who can transcribe. We had people there who had accessibility issues. Some people had, you know, had a, a tape recording of the, the materials. She did it so gently and the, the women just went, you know, it's basically saying, you know, are you saying people with, you know, a low IQ aren't part of our society? Should they not be represented? Do they not have a voice? But she didn't say like Just the way she, she said it was perfect. And I thought, we need more of that. You know, we need more of that kind of robust debate, but really respectfully inclusive. That leads on to gender equality in politics, list votes, a whole mm. area. How, how do you both feel about that? Elsa, how do you feel about the fact that certain seats should have women only as the next candidate? I don't agree with it. Uh, I think it's any discrimination is wrong, whether it's positive or negative. I can understand that there might be situations where you want to actively encourage um, maybe a minority group to, to take part but I don't see why somebody should be getting a ticket just because they, they're they under, underrepresented. By all means encourage them through and kind of coach them into it but not necessarily say we're blanking everybody out um, unless you fit this particular group and only you guys get a shot at it. Obviously as a as a woman and I, I work in a male-dominated uh, environment, I would hate to think that I only got a job because I was a woman and not because I was the right person for the job. I completely agree, and it's actually another area that I really feel strongly about because as a problem solver, I don't get what the problem is that they're trying to fix because I think we could add new problems to this without, you know, like members feeling, women members, including Ailsa and myself, feeling disengaged from the process, that we don't get choice. Um, I've argued that, you know, if you don't give people a choice, then you can't whip them into putting funds in, putting time and effort in. And the last thing you want to do is assume that that will happen right up to the last minute when it's not there. Because that would be, you know, crazy. You know, why why would you do that? You, would, you really need to keep engaging people. And the other thing for me is, it's all, to me, lacks transparency. I mean, my seat's an all-female list. I'm a woman. Nobody's ever encouraged me into how you would do that. You know, I went along to a kind of session about, but it wasn't about Hollywood. It was about council elections, which is 2022, which I thought was a bit odd considering the next election's Hollywood. But, you know, it, it doesn't feel that it's achieving the purpose. It's, it, it feels tick box. That what, what happens if we get exactly 50-50 or 52, technically 52% are women, 52% of the MPs, or sorry, MSPs are, are women and the rest are men. So what happens if that, I mean, bear in mind the elector have a choice. So all we can do is try to fudge it up to a point, but you also um, run the risk that the electorate go, why are you giving me a subset from your party? I don't know, I ain't keen on that. The electorate have a choice as well. So it seems very internal until you think, actually, we don't control the electorate. We have to convince the electorate. And the best way to convince, as they also said, I wouldn't want to win or get a job based on the fact I was in a subset of candidates that had the, the advantage. I would want a really rich hustings, internal hustings, with as many candidates as possible to have a really rich, robust debate. And whoever, even if it wasn't my preferred candidate, I would go with a consensus if that was a democratic process that somebody got picked and you would get behind that because that is kind of how democracy works. But are, we coming, are we coming from a time when women were denied the opportunity by men? Is that, is that me showing my age? Because I know that certainly was the case. 
they still if you went them. along to a, a, a political hustings. But I mean, I would. You might, you might have a lady chairing the meeting, but every other candidate was a man. If that's the case, as I also said before, sorry, Elsa, that what what steps are been doing not are, are been done not just to encourage women into politics, but to keep them in politics because mm -hmm. the cases that, that I keep raising are Gail Ross and Aileen Campbell are stepping down. Yeah. They didn't get in an all female list, mm -hmm. and nothing nothing that's changed that's going to help keep people, particularly with caring responsibilities or from rural constituencies, from mm -hmm. staying. You know, your valid, you know, active. I mean. Aileen's in the, in the cabinet, isn't she? She's the minister. So, you know, what, what is the problem? It's a bigger problem. Representation, like you referenced the Citizens Assembly, it's supposed to be representative group of Scots. If you really want to look at that seriously, you need to actually do the, the serious work and not make it a tick box exercise. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. to encourage people from across the spectrum in, that takes quite a lot of work. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do that work. And, and it worries me that this is going to have a negative effect and put people off. Because I, I know a lot, I've not actually met any women, including somebody who I happen to know as a candidate, who agrees with me that all female is not a good thing and she's on one. This, so, you know, this, that's quite an interesting... Gail, you know, Gail, Gail Ross is a perfect example for illustrating that problem of why you cannot have two people sharing that position if that is agreed that we should be opening our minds to possibilities. Because she's got a heck of a distance to travel. The if you've got, there a, now. If you've got a family, how, how much you should be deprived from that. And the, the, the weird example of that is Ruth Davidson, who said she was leaving because she was not spending enough time with her family. I think she'll she'll have her, her seat. She'll be the Scottish Secretary in Leith. You know, that'll be the next anointment once she gets her. But going, going back to one thing you were saying there, it's like, this will be the last parliament where this matters. Because in the next parliament, they'll put through that GRA bill and they'll need to have 57 different kinds of genders to get their gender balance right. In which case, there'll only be two women in the parliament. I mean, gender balance isn't in itself representative of the society. You know, that's, that's one factor. You know, you know they, they touched on having candidates from minorities, you know, like ethnicities. Um, so... How do you cut it? Do you say, well, you've got to be a woman and then you've got to be, you know, from a particular minority and then, uh, then someone else says, well, what about us? And mm -hmm. it all feels very finger in the right. You know, you, you close one hole and another opens. And I think no one who wants to put themselves forward should be denied the opportunity of people listening to them and selecting them. I mean, I don't understand the timing of this. We were told at our general election hustings and everything that... I'm in Stirling, that this would be the last MP in Stirling. So that that assumes we will not be fighting a general election in 2024. So the people we've got at the moment who will be there until 2024, unless independence happens beforehand, which we all sincerely hope, um, that means that this group of, you know, exceptionally talented and experienced politicians aren't available to the people of Scotland until 2026, which is the next holiday election. Why now on dual mandates? That's what I don't get. Because I've raised the question, I raised it, you know, many, many people, that if, if, if the problem is about by-election costs, what about the councillors? Exactly. Because, you know, you could have, you've got 400 plus councillors, you know, they could all... Even that we're on the, on the NEC. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's another thing. If a dual mandate is the problem, why have people got dual mandates in internal and external roles? Exactly. You know, if, you're, if your job as an elected official is to do your job as an elected official, why have you got other roles internally in the party? Surely with 100 and odd thousand people, people shouldn't have like, you know, three or four jobs. We, we've, we've got a big constituency and we've got major problems at the moment, you know, seriously bad problems. And as everybody has in Scotland trying to cope with the pandemic and the economic fallout of that, we need people to have full focus on the key things there and not be doing all this extracurricular stuff because you know I remember you know the opposition were, went after Philippa, Dr Philippa who's a breast cancer surgeon yeah. for doing for helping out at her hospital and it's like wait a minute surely rational thought must come into this at some point she's doing something necessary and good and yet you've got other people who are like executive directors and whatever but if, if we want to be different we need to first of all do things within our own gift and that and in political parties is look at your internal structures, fix that first. Don't have people on multiple committees and things making decisions. Spread that out and make it more democratic and people will get more engaged and feel less 
kind of what? what what are you doing if people don't understand what's going on you've got a problem because then people create perceptions and the perception might be wrong but it still has the same effect well i think that's why you that's also why you've got um at least two list parties at the moment isp and the alliance for independence is coming from frustration not just at the lack of, of, of let's say, a, a Section 30 request and a promise of a referendum in autumn of this year, but just a general sense of the direction not being up to speed in the right direction. And that pervades, I think, an awful lot. It's why I've never been a member of a political party, because I always worry as soon as anyone builds a structure which looks like a pyramid, goes back to your point about how low can you get the the representation and that to me is the problem at the moment is that people have been given expectations of things happening and separating COVID out from it I can understand why that has interfered with things there are other people in the hierarchy of the Scottish National Party and in the government who are not trying to deal with COVID in a television broadcast day after day after day there are people specifically who are there who are meant to be doing everything they can to push forward the independence cause. And yet there's a complete blank in that. And I, that is why a lot of people are frustrated at the moment. It's why other things are happening. You know, I agree with what you're saying about the, the COVID thing. But look, for me, COVID is a major incident, right? And incident management has to run in parallel with problem solving. Now, managing the us through the incident or you know in bank terminology it's like you you run the bank you change the bank they are two separate streams they run in parallel so incident management managing a major incident through the country through a pandemic but in parallel we have to be looking at the root cause of a lot of the problems that Kate Forbes has come up against we don't have borrowing that we don't have it within our gift to actually close our borders when we need to you know and these things need to be part of the same conversation you know we need to, as you say, not have everybody, like a football thing, everybody running after the same ball. You have to have your defence, you know, the instant manager side, but also have your midfield and your forwards actually looking at what we're trying to do to progress forward so that when another incident that's not in our control happens, we're actually better positioned. Last week, everybody got a bit of a shock when, uh, when the, the explosion happened in Lebanon. But when you saw that short wave coming across, it was just like, of course, it brought everything up about what we've actually got sitting across in the West Coast. And I'm not even necessarily talking about a nuclear strike, which would probably take half the country, well, probably take the whole country, because there's 200 of the things. Just, just see them accident and with the amount of nuclear stuff that's going across, across the roads. Well, what I would say is don't get too afraid, Dave, OK? No. Because as we're getting involved in some of the circuit and uh, going to some of the rallies and catching up with what people believe and information that they have been given, there's an element of uh, sanity that needs to get put into it as well. So yes, what you're saying about when you saw the, the Beirut explosion going off, and my thought was that it was nuclear as well. Just four miles from me is where they're all sitting. If there was to be an accident there, there would have to be a, a certain number of elements all lined up in a row for that accident to be catastrophic, I believe. Okay, somebody might come on that knows much more about nuclear weapons that can say, no, it's actually, it's, it's quite easy to have an accident. But I think with any accident, it has to be a, a certain sequence of failings that all happen at the one time, and then that's when you get it. I did see floating around on Facebook and on Twitter, not long after the Beirut one, the uh, kill zone, the, the graphic that kind of floats around from time to time. Um, and that's one that we actually try to debunk because that is not a Trident missile. And even if you had 200 of them, I think you might still be slightly reduced in terms of that radius. Really, if, if, if one missile went off on a uh, cool port, then you're talking maybe about a 15 kilometre radius. Uh, and that would be a kind of uh, you know, light blast damage so it's it's a lot more centralized as opposed to the, the big graphic that you sometimes see floating around the, the areas you mentioned about when you're traveling when it's traveling on the roads yes if there was a, an accident and um i do remember but back in the 80s the the traffic lights in helensborough went to red when the, the convoy came down and they didn't know what to do 
they actually stopped and uh, it caused one of the, the wagons behind it to kind of come to a standstill as well. And that's maybe the, the closest that certainly that I, I can recall of any sort of accident. But again, with an accident, you need a number of failings before you actually have something that's going to be catastrophic. What is maybe more likely is that if there was a, an accident and something got damaged and there was more of a radiation leak as opposed to an actual blast, that's where you would be re relying on all your local authorities to have some sort of action plan in place so that if there was a leak because something got cracked, that they can actually cope with that. And given some of the uh, the pandemic that we're in and we've seen the, the response to some of these things that take you completely by surprise, have we got an awful lot of confidence in the local authorities? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe some of them will uh, act on it a wee bit better. In terms of the, the actual blast, and it's, it's my opinion, and somebody is more than welcome to come along and, and say that I'm wrong, I don't think the blast is going to be the biggest issue that we would be looking at. I think it's more the escape of any radioactive material. And where we are, it's not so much somebody dropping one of the bombs, it's the nuclear reactors and the subs and the radioactive materials that they are then discharging into the loch. That's where we're getting the, the, the risk from. So it's more to do with like, almost environmental seepage yeah. as opposed to blast damage. It's, it's, it's the nuclear reactors. All, the, all that coolant water, it's going somewhere. And I know that up in Faz Lane, they're looking at building the new treatment plant and this is going to siphon it off. But you will still get seepage. Once that tritium's in the water, it's radioactive hydrogen. It goes wherever hydrogen can go, which is water. I've seen it more now that COVID has kicked in. I'm seeing lots and lots of people in the Clyde swimming. You know, the kids are all off school. They're all down the beach. They're all swimming about. You know, how much are they maybe ingesting when the wave comes in? And how much is actually in that? And once it's in your body, you know, it's a, um, a beta particle. So, I mean, it's, it's only going to go a small distance. It's not going to escape your body. What tests are done in that, Elsa? There is CEPA monitoring. Um, I know that they have certainly they have got a, a level of th thresholds and SEPA are they, they kind of monitor Faz Lane, but Faz Lane being a crown estate, the, the, they're not completely covered by SEPA. So I know that there is some testing. I haven't seen any results for, but then I haven't looked, Mike. But yeah, I think it's more, it was, it was worse in the 80s and certainly in the very early 90s when we had the Americans up at the Holy Loch and they were just discharging a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, had, I had a discussion with someone. It, it led me on to look at whether or not a nuclear deterrent, it, it, it's old fashioned out of date and it should be rid of, but leave that aside, that the new war will be cyber attacks. And there was in fact a report last year where a nuclear power station somewhere in the UK was cyber attacked and they had to call in a, it's the national cyber security center to actually help out resolve the problem that they faced and you're sitting down saying why are we allowing anything like that to exist if scotland this month was capable from wind energy of providing all the electricity we need why are we thinking of anything nuclear? That's where I start from. It, there okay. was a time, again, it's to do with politicians telling the truth or even understanding the truth. There was a time when perhaps it was tempting to look at this source of energy as being a positive thing. But you then have to ask the question, well, it's positive for us just now, but how many millions of years down the road mm -hmm. is someone going to have to solve the problems we've created? No, I mean, just what you're saying about the cyber attacks, I mean, that's actually, it hadn't dawned on me. What if there's a cyber attack on one of the power stations and they, they start messing around with the control rods and before you know it, you've got Chernobyl? Well, see, well, see that? See what you're talking? I've got a hard drive here. Um, that I got a virus on it like, like eight years ago. And the virus is called Stuxnet, and I can't attach it to anything because the minute it was on the destroys your machine, I bought a net, 
And this was developed by the Americans and the Israelis to bring down the, the, the Iranian nuclear thing by doing exactly what you're talking about, going for the, the fuel roads. And it basically, they say back, they say back the, the Iranian nuclear thing uh, by four or five years. But the Americans didn't want to release it, and the Israelis did it anyway. The two of you have touched on it. I mean, nuclear weapons are so out of date because they're not they're not solving anything right now. They're not protecting anybody from anything. You know, if you go all the way back to when um, you had 9-11, so you've got the terrorism from there, you can get eco-terrorism, you get cyber-terrorism, and these weapons, they're, they're pointless. They're, they're not doing anything. So from a, a financial and a moral uh, perspective, it's why have we got them? And then you've got well, to ship them round uh, the world and have this permanent deterrent at sea, you're polluting the oceans. It's just it's a, madness. It's ironic that, you know, the the thing they did in 2016 in the UK showed that the a pandemic was the number one risk. A pandemic was the number one risk. Well, look how prepared everybody was for that. Even when they could see it happening in December, from December, we'd friends over in Spain um, that we were like, I think people thought we were barking at the moon. We were saying, why are people not taking this seriously? What's unique about us? You know, look at Spain, mm -hmm. look at Italy, look at France, look at, you know, Korea, look at China. Um, and it doesn't fill you with a huge amount of confidence. You know, that if you say the nuclear deterrent is where a lot of money goes into, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of corporate gain in that. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot, if you look at the risk ratio of probability severity, you're creating a hugely severe problem, you know, a huge risk in your solution. You know, and if, back to the energy side of it, I had this conversation with somebody in 2014, the referendum, and they were talking about, they were kind of rhyming out the line about, oh, I think we need a mixed bag of, um, of energy options, whatever, including nuclear. And I just said, just to be clear, if we were starting a blank bit of paper mm -hmm. for an energy solution, and we were looking at the criteria that made the best solution, like a decision analysis, having a legacy of a half-life of hundreds of thousands of years probably would rule nuclear off the table, particularly if you have alternatives that are, you know, renewable, sustainable. You know, we've got, we're always going to have tides. We're always going to have wind, you know, up here. Uh, if we don't, we've got a bigger problem. Um, so, you know, we've got 25% of the renewable potential of Europe. Why are Scotland looking at this? Because we don't have control of energy. That's why. It's plainly and simply that. But then you look at what's happening in the south of England with Hinkley Sea. And on the one hand, we're told, you know, boo hiss to the Chinese, you know, we're worried about cyber attacks. And then we're letting them build a nuclear power station, the, you know, the biggest one down there, which is going to be the most expensive units of electricity in the world. Yeah. So why, do, why are people not asking why? It's back. It's back to the. It's back to the vestiges of empire that's in the minds of a lot of people in the south of England, where you have, as I understand it now, the UK. I think Britain had the largest fleet in the world at one stage. We now apparently have a navy which is smaller than that of Italy. You use it now for catching refugees. We've got aircraft carriers without planes on them. Scotland needs its own defence force, it needs its own coastal agencies, like another 190 countries in the world. Yeah, exactly. We, don't, we do not need nuclear deterrence. Yeah. I'd love to see Scotland being the first country to say, listen folks, could everyone else do what we're doing and just get rid of them? Move them out of here? Yeah. Sink them? Do well, whatever, you, whatever you can. You tell me what you do with them, Elsa. I, I would certainly be getting rid of them because even if one country turns around and says we don't want them anymore, that's a big step change for the for the other. Okay, so England might take them. So there's still nine countries that will have them. But for somebody to actually turn around and say we don't want them anymore, I think that would be a, a bit of a wake-up call for the rest of the world. You know, as you say, there's 190 odd countries that don't have them. Um, going back to almost like why we started out, we started out after Indiref. And it was the, obviously the area where, where we live. Um, it's a big catchment area for the bases. Um, we started looking at some of the, the numbers and there's like t nearly 20,000 voters within the, oh, 
Oh, God, I lost you. No. no <laughs> uh, there's like nearly 20,000 voters in Helensborough, Woman North. Um, and we, in our Gale and Butte, it was nearly 60% no. So we were saying, if we are ever going to turn this round, we need to start telling the, pe the good people of Helensborough and the surrounding area that you will not lose your job. You can have an alternative. Uh, and, and this is why we, we why we started out. Um, so we've been kind of going around a lot of the, the indie circuit. And this year, if we hadn't had COVID, we were already kind of bringing it back to the local area because we're no offence to anybody that we see on the on the rallies and everything, but we're preaching to the converted, and we really need to get back to those people that maybe haven't considered the fact that you would still have. A, a stores job and an admin job and a, a cleaning job and a, a technical job in in those areas without nuclear weapons yeah. with a with a surface fleet. You've got Portsmouth, you've got Plymouth. They're all uh, areas that are doing well. They're surface fleet, so why can't we do it? You know, and it's just trying to get that um, almost to Ali's point. Nobody seems to be asking why. Why can they do it and we can't? And, and this is what we're trying to get to. One of the things I noticed on your website, I, I mentioned that our Facebook page, was the ex the explosive material that was still being wash washed up in beaches, which mm. takes you to, when we're talking about the half-life of nuclear activity, takes you to Beaufort Dyke, yeah. where, <laughs> where Boris Johnson wants to build a bridge where there are anthrax spores, sarin spores, all meant to be encased in barrels, which are then meant to be encased in cement. And these, mm. these, these, these are short-term risks, and we just threw it all into a big hole in the Irish Sea. And that again comes back to the fact, how do we get people involved in these things that have got inquiring minds? It's one of the reasons I support the Covenant, because if you're in the covenant and you've signed up for it, it takes you through to something called the People's Assembly, which is like the Citizens' Assembly, Dave, and I think is a precursor to what might happen in an independent Scotland. Can I just pick up on what Elsa was saying about um, you, you were 60% no, so we're sterling. And, you know, for me, that's always been the most important thing to turn that around. And I have to say, I think our previous MP, Stephen Kerr, did a good job of turning <laughs> people the other way. <laughs> but you know, in some ways it's harder to pull people than it is to push them from a negative. You know, he was very pro-Brexit, you know, and mm. I think that was to his detriment, particularly in a 68% remain area. So what, what we decided to do, although Butterflies Rising has been going since October, Mo the people who are on it, you know, mostly have been active for a long time and co having conversations and trying, you know, in their own communities. We've all now just kind of networked together across Stirlingshire and beyond. We've, you know, through the rallies and stuff, we've met loads of people, which is great. You know, you've got a really good network of folk and you get, you know, share ideas and share enthusiasm and everything. But the 60% thing is really important to, and I think from what you're saying, Elsa, you're doing exactly the same process we did, is to not ignore and shout down but to actually try and understand people's concerns because people need to feel validated and you know I, I raised this in a, in a talk I did what I think we need to do is paint a vision from everything that people had concerns about in 2014 what made them not vote for for yes and take that leap of faith and for some people it was a bigger leap than others depending on where, where you were now not just because we want them to vote yes which we do but because their concerns are valid. That's people's mm -hmm. concerns about their lives, their communities, their families, their business, their, you know, their jobs, whatever. Yet we can't dismiss that because if we want to be the country we claim we want to be, we have to listen to everybody. Mm -hmm. And people's concerns about pensions, people's concerns about their jobs, you know, particularly if they're all they've heard for so long is your job's here because the nuclear subs are here. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't dismiss that. You know, people have got a genuine concern that that's true. Now, you can either, you know, argue against that or you can start to paint a different picture. And, you know, the reframing stuff we talk a lot about and saying, well, actually, if that's the case, how come 
they've got those jobs and they don't have that. And I think that's really, really important because one of the analogies I, I kind of use is that some people, when you're selling a house, well, you, know, you can take them to an empty shell and they'll just see an empty shell and go, oh, not for me. You know, some people, other people will see knocking down walls, putting in bifold doors, put, build an extension, you know, blah, 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 and landscaping the garden and they can see the vision. Some people literally need to see the show house. And, mm -hmm. you know, we need to assume the kind of lowest level of, of vision, you know, and that's no disrespect to everybody. Everybody's different. We're all unique. We've all got our own talents and skills and, you know, if we were all the same, it'd be pretty boring. So we have to paint that picture for people of what the art of the possible is. But the really critical part is to build in the democratic empowerment checkpoints along the way to say, we're not saying that's what you're definitely getting. Here's your options, you know, of what you could have, what the potential is. But the really important thing is it will be your choice. You'll get a say in it rather than trying to answer all the questions up front. And I think we did quite a reactive job in 2014 of we put, you know, the, the Scottish government put out the white paper, which was compared to the other side putting out nothing, which was, mm -hmm. you know, for, for people on the kind of critical thinking side go, well, clearly they've put thought into it and they've not. But mm -hmm. what we did on the flip side is we, we opened ourselves up to, to the criticism. We were constantly reacting. So what we need to do is be proactive this time. Yep, a, a nice big, a nice big three-word slogan on the side of bus beats a, a, a three-hundred-page white paper any day. I think it's really important to do both. I had this conversation about on a Facebook page the other day that the graphic images are great, the war and peace detail and stuff is great, and I think the what, what's happened during COVID that's gone down really well. You need to learn why that is. You know, do you know, kind of what and the why. Because the, the, what they've done with the phases, you know, you've got you've got the high level. Okay, clearly we need this is what's happening on these dates, and we understand the date. There's dates, but we understand the dates are flexible because it's depending on variables that we are not in our control about the the community transmission and everything. So people get behind that. You know, if you treat people like grown ups, they generally respond. But there's a whole pile of detail underneath that. So we need both. We need we need the the high level. And we need the detail underneath it for people that want to know more in certain areas that they need to know more in. And I think having that three-dimensional vision is really important. But you're right. And the thing I always think we absolutely missed a trick on in 2014 is we didn't use taking back control, which is actually a really good slogan. But it's now totally tarnished because they use it for Brexit. We'll but they put a huge amount of money into this, you know, like focus groups and what lands and whatever. But simple messages are something that people can understand as long as there's a robust detail underneath it. We've got the new one though, let's get going. That was an absolute piece. I wish they would. <laughs> anyway, ladies, uh, it's been absolutely great having you on. Uh, and I tell you, I've been sitting here the night time. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. But be nice to you. And, and, you see, <laughs> and, and honestly, that's why we got you on. Because, uh, because basically for me, I would kick them over the border and say, if you're so happy with your news, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's nuts, because at the end of the day, it's, it does the work with everyone. Um, there's a lot of different battles to get fought in a lot of different places. So a lot of different discussions to have in different places. Thank well, you, ladies. Uh, Thanks very much, guys. Uh, nice to meet you, Elsa. Thanks very much. Uh, talk to you later. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. And in life,